The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey everyone, welcome back to our series on key battles in the Revolutionary War. In the previous episode, we left you on a cliffhanger with the Quebec campaign where Benedict Arnold is leading his troops through a vast overland campaign in the winter in Canada. They're facing starvation conditions. Some men are shoeless because they have boiled their shoe leather in order to eat it and are walking through the snow barefoot, trying to lay siege in Canada. And now they are at the gates of Quebec. So what's going to happen, James? All right. Just let me give a little bit more background uh, in case it's been a while since our listeners have listened to the last one. Arnold had marched up through the wilderness of Maine. As you mentioned, a lot of hardship, people sick, shoeless, uh, really having a hard time. He had tried to lay lay siege to Quebec with just his own force, but that didn't work. Those stubborn people in Quebec, they just would not surrender, even after he asked three times. (laughs) (laughs) And so he decided to call off the siege and wait for General Montgomery, who had been in Montreal, to arrive. But Montgomery seemed to take quite a while. In the meantime, the British overall commander, General Guy Carleton, also came up from Quebec. I mean, I'm sorry, from Montreal to Quebec and reinforced the defenders in Quebec. And that's where we left off. And now Montgomery finally arrives on December 1st, but he only has with him at this time 500 men. Again, uh, the cold and just disease in general had been working as a team to re- reduce the force greatly. They'd had a few uh, skirmishes with the British as well. So Montgomery's force is greatly reduced from what it originally was when he set, stepped off from, um, from New York State a while back, back in the fall. Okay, so Montgomery and Arnold combine their forces. They try again to lay siege to Quebec, and now they have a combined force of about 1,100. But unfortunately for them, the British now, uh, with Carleton and his reinforcements, they have about 1,800. So the attackers have 1,100, the Americans, the British, the defenders have 1,800. That is not good odds, particularly when your uh, defenders are behind walls, (laughs) when they're fortified, heavily fortified. Finally, though, on December 31st, after almost a month, Arnold and Montgomery decided to assault the town under cover of a snowstorm. So it's the snow is falling, a blinding snow you can't hardly see in front of you. The Americans charged through this, hoping to catch the British by surprise. And for a while, they succeed. They broke into the weakest part of the city, which is called the Lower Town. Daniel Morgan's riflemen that we mentioned in our last discussion, they played a very large part in the attack. They were key in picking off soldiers. They were really... Uh, good sharpshooters or snipers, we would say today. They didn't use that term back then. But even though the Americans broke through into the lower town, they could not penetrate the heavier defenses of the upper town. And many Americans were killed, including, I'm, I'm sorry, not not killed in this case. I was uh, Some Americans got trapped. There will be, there are some killed as well. But right now I want to highlight the ones that were trapped. Daniel Morgan himself is trapped and they had to surrender. Yeah. Now, speaking of people who were killed, unfortunately for the Americans, General Montgomery, who's in overall command, he was killed. So Montgomery, General Montgomery, he's out of the picture. Benedict Arnold is not killed, but he's very seriously wounded. He's shot through the leg. The Patriots suffered about 450 casualties, of whom about 50 were killed or wounded, and about 400 were captured. So that's a lot of prisoners. And it I, I'm going to mention in passing that eventually one fourth of these that were captured changed sides. They went over to the British. So uh, that's kind of ironic, isn't it? Some hmm. <laughs> 100 of Ar- Benedict Arnold's soldiers <laughs> switched sides. 
Arnold was probably cursing them, but mm, be careful. With, <laughs> he had <laughs> subtle judge. influence on them, I guess. Yeah, don't judge. Uh, the British took perhaps 40 casualties, n- not nearly as many as the Americans. Arnold, uh, he pulls back, he re- resumes this, the siege, but it's just not going to happen. He finally has to leave the army himself. He leaves them behind under the command of General John Sullivan. Um, he's got his leg injury is just too bad. He's got to get that taken care of. Finally, on March 4th, 1776. So this is uh, quite a long time. This is, what, four months? Arnold had reached Quebec originally on November 8th, 1775. Now we're up to March of 1776. A British fleet brings 7,000 reinforcements under General John Burgoyne to Quebec. And again, he's going to occupy a lot of our attention later on. But for now, he's just going to park his forces there. 7,000, that's too much even for Benedict Arnold to deal with. (laughs) Benedict Arnold was very aggressive, very confident in his own abilities and the abilities of his men. But, I mean, come on, Uh, you know, like five or 600 people can't take on 7,000 plus. So Arnold has to retreat upriver to Montreal. During the retreat, many of the Patriot force died of smallpox, which is occasionally would break out and decimate the American troops and the British as well sometimes. So also Arnold's men were hungry. They were suffering from famine or, for, you know, just almost starving to death. They had to raid farms of the habitants, the, the French be- people that they were hoping to win to their side. And, of course, that's not going <laughs> to that's not going to help your cause very much. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit ironic that, in a sense, it's a mirror image. Not exactly, but the British experience in the colonies where they come expecting to be great liberators, but by trying to live off the land, they alienate the people who live there. So the Americans are just paying it forward to Canada. Exactly. You know, it's one thing to criticize the Catholic Church, but then you start stealing my food. Now, that's <laughs> that's serious. Uh, so a lot of these of these French speaking Canadians say, oh, forget this. We're, we're sticking with the British. Carleton, finally, uh, the British commander, Guy Carleton, he decides he's going to go on the offensive. In early June, he fights off an American counterattack. Arnold has to pull out of Montreal back into the United States. Carnal Carlton constantly hits him from behind, and he moves to Fort St. John, which he captures and it goes back into British hands. The Patriots, now, as I mentioned, they're under the command of John Sullivan. They retreated from Fort St. John, and this is what Sullivan wrote. He wrote, I found myself at the head of a dispirited army, filled with horror at the thought of seeing their enemy. Smallpox, famine, and disorder had rendered them almost lifeless. Another a uh, person in the army, another Patriot soldier, he wrote this. He said, lice and maggots were creeping in millions over the victims. Ugh. So it's just horrible. It's something like, almost like something out of a horror movie. It sounds like uh, when the French are, Napoleon's army are retreating from Russia, that type of thing. I'm sure there's some similarities there. Uh, you're dealing with cold and famine and disease and uh, discouragement. They just keep getting driven back and back. Carlton orders the building of a fleet that was to sail down Lake Champlain deep into American territory toward Fort Ticonderoga. Here we see the genesis of a plan uh, to cut the colonies in half. Carlton is hoping that through a combined army and navy, he can go down the Hudson River, take control of it, and that'll isolate New England from the rest of the colonies. If we can get New England bottled up and basically put them under siege and conquer New England, then the other colonies will fall into line. That's the plan. And is it going to work? Let's find out. Uh, Let's see. Carlton is sailing down, but he is stopped at Valcour Island. Valcour Island is an island in Lake Champlain, and he didn't see that there were some American gunboats there, 13. And guess who they were under the command of? Well, you've got the notes, Scott. So <laughs> That's not fair. Scott is disqualified from guessing, but listener, can you guess who, which American was commanding these boats? It's Benedict Arnold. There he is again. Benedict Arnold has recovered somewhat from his injury, and Benedict Arnold stops this British fleet. And this is a battle that almost nobody's ever heard of, and I'd love to go into more detail, but we don't have time. But the Battle of Valcour Island some say right here, right now, 
Arnold saves the revolution. He stops the British from going any further south. Carleton turns around and goes back north to Montreal and says that's enough for now. So another kudos to Benedict Arnold for possibly, quite possibly, saving the revolution. Of course, we don't know what would have happened had he not stopped uh, Guy Carleton's fleet, but it would not have been good, I guarantee you that. All right, so Arnold has another victory. He's the hero of Valcour Island. And finally, the Patriot Army staggers into Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, here's John Adams again, our designated go-to guy for great quotes. <laughs> John Adams said they were disgraced, defeated, discontented, diseased, naked, undisciplined, and eaten up with vermin. So that's an interesting quote, isn't it, Scott? It, he, it was almost great alliteration for four words, but then he couldn't think of a word for naked that started with a D. <laughs> uh, disrobed? Disrobed, there you go. Doesn't yes. have the same panache, so I, I see what Adams was doing. But I thought it was interesting, this event right here, the Quebec campaign, which was not successful, but Valcour Island, which was successful, these stories have been almost completely eclipsed, and you're going to talk later about Henry Knox, and that is something that is a much better run. I won't give it away. But the retreat from Quebec, I said earlier, you don't see anything like this, maybe Napoleon's retreat from Moscow or other like absolutely death-defying, harrowing things where you're, you're shocked that soldiers are even able to live to make it back from there. Why was this event eclipsed in the public imagination from what we're going to see with Henry Knox? I'm guessing it's because Benedict Arnold is at the cockpit. That's my best explanation. That's what I was going to say too, Scott. Yeah, it may be that later generations of historians and teachers in general wanted to downplay everything Benedict Arnold did. That may be why nobody knows about the attack on Quebec in general and definitely not Valcour Island. Right. We're veering a little bit into historiography of how history is constructed. But in the series that James and I did on the Civil War, we mentioned that the first generation of historians of the Civil War were Confederates, some of them Confederate generals. And they crafted a narrative that has been successfully repeated even up to this day of justifying why the South did what it did, that racism, that slavery was on the eclipse. That wasn't the main point of the war. I would venture to guess, I don't know really the historiography of the Revolutionary War, but I would assume that from the very beginning, casting Benedict Arnold as a villain and somebody who's writing a history of the Quebec campaign would, like you kind of joked, James, earlier, that a quarter of the troops that are captured, the Patriot troops, end up fighting for the other side. Some historian writing in 1820 would say, under the devilish direction of Arnold the traitor, they decided to throw their allegiances into the fire and fight for the ignoble British, whatever. So that's my idea of we might be seeing a little bit of historiography at play, but I don't know for certain. So this is my speculation. Yeah, I think it's pretty good guess. Okay, so the end, let's sum up this campaign, this failed attempt to take Canada. Yeah. By the end of the campaign, the Patriots had suffered 5,000 total casualties. That, in Revolutionary War terms, that is huge. The Civil War, you know, that's like one day, right? Right. <laughs> but, uh, just all in a day's work. But obviously, the, the numbers of casualties that we're going to see in the Revolutionary War are much smaller, as are the sizes of the armies. So 5,000 casualties, that is a huge amount. And that's something that the, the Continentals could ill afford to lose that that was just extremely painful i mean it would always be painful to lose five thousand. but when you when you have a ragtag army that's mainly made up of militia a lot of whom just go home after a few months five thousand uh killed wounded and captured that's just irreplaceable it's just awful um and this would be the first and only campaign that the Americans make on Canada in the Revolutionary War. Now, they're going to try again in the War of 1812, but maybe we'll do another series on that in the future. We're not going to talk about the War of 1812, <laughs> yeah. other than what I just said. Uh, but so this seals the fate of Canada in that Canada is never seriously going to be thought of as a potential recruit to the American cause. They're, they're going to stay firmly within the orbit of the British Empire. And some Revolutionary War historians have questioned the logic of even thinking of this campaign in the beginning. Even if everything had gone perfectly, even if all of Benedict Arnold's forces had been 
woodsmen who could navigate well and let's say they were able to lead a successful siege and capture Quebec and Montreal and everything else, there wouldn't have been an ability to defend Quebec and Montreal against British sea power. Whatever the Patriots have, they will never have parity with British sea power in any conceivable way. And by stroke of fortune, later on in the war, through turns of events and new alliances, I won't give anything away, spoilers, but the Patriots by themselves couldn't do it. The Royal Navy is the greatest sea power in the world, and it's invincible when it's attacking a port city. St. Lawrence provides deep water access needed by the British, and an English commander could easily retake and hold Canada against other invasions. So at the very best, this invasion has little hope of achieving any permanent gain. And at worst, as it looks like it turns out here, it was a huge loss of necessary forces. But all right, that's the downer stuff. Let's end on a happy note. So let's talk about something that is remembered fondly, Knox's Camden Run. James, what's that all about? Yeah, and the, I have to say, I'm proud to say that as far as I know, the term cannon run is my term. I made that up. Okay. If you look at a textbook, you will not see that unless I'm mistaken. I mean, probably somebody. I was thinking of that 80s somewhere. movie, Cannonball Run. Cannonball Run. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, hopefully this will be much more entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Let me go ahead. I'm going to go out of order here. Let me, let's talk about Henry Knox. Henry Knox is a fascinating character. Uh, listeners, if you remember our Civil War series, you remember how Scott and I constantly marveled about how so many Civil War generals had no military <laughs> experience whatsoever. We saw, and some of them, despite their lack of experience, turned out to be really very good commanders. Um, we saw... Uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who had been a philosophy professor, uh, turned out to be an outstanding commander. We saw for the Union, Benjamin Grierson, who had been a music teacher. Uh, we saw politicians, some of whom, most of whom were not very good. Some, some were. We saw people like Nathan Bedford Forrest, who had been a businessman, a slave trader, you know, not, not the nicest guy, but the point is he, he didn't have any military experience and he turned into a constant thorn in the side of the Union. Uh, we saw Episc an Episcopal bishop who wasn't, he was okay. He wasn't particularly great, but we saw all kinds of people become uh, high ranking military commanders on both sides. Well, in the American Revolution, that certainly does not happen in the British. I mean, the British Army is professional, and all these top generals had been in the Army for years and years and years. Most of them had fought in the Seven Years' War. Uh, some of them had fought in North America. We've already talked about Gage, for example. We've talked about William Howe. Uh, but on the American side, they didn't have a professional army. They didn't have very many people. that Some had fought. Some Americans had fought in the French and Indian War. But a lot were too young to have fought. And Henry Knox is one of those guys. Henry Knox was born in 1750 in Boston to a shipmaster who was lost at sea when Henry was nine. So like a lot of these people in early American history, uh, Henry Knox lost his dad at a very young age. Uh, Washington had lost his dad, Thomas Jefferson. A lot of people grew up without a father in the house. And this forced these kind of people like Knox to work uh, and to earn money at a very early age. So from the age of nine, he worked to help support his family. Knox was almost entirely self-educated. He didn't get a lot of schooling. He certainly didn't go to college kind of like Washington, kind of like Nathaniel Green, where we've touched on him. We'll talk about him more later. Uh, Knox eventually becomes a successful bookseller. So he's like you and me, Scott. He's a nerd. He likes to read, he, and he sells books. He loved reading in particular about the military arts. See, there's another thing he had in common with us. He, he was an mili amateur military historian. Well, Scots are professional. I'm, Not I'm military, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm semi-pro, but uh, he was an amateur. He loved reading about the military arts, and as did Nathaniel Green. He and Nathaniel Green struck up a friendship because they both loved reading military history. Green would often come to Knox's bookstore, um, and they became friends, as I mentioned. Knox was a large man by any standards, but especially by the standards of the time. He was six foot tall, which back then you were a giant if you were six feet tall, and he weighed about 250 pounds, so he was a very large man. He had lost two fingers in a bird hunting expedition prior to the war, so he had a couple of missing fingers. He kept it in a, um, a 
a, a white handkerchief or a cloth wrapped around his hand. And so, again, Scott, I'm, he's a very interesting fella. I know I've said that 5,000 times, but it's just it's fascinating to me that this guy who's a bookseller, a, a history nerd, he's going to turn into one of Washington's most valuable subordinates. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I didn't know that much about him. And that's to my shame because I am from the gorgeous metropolis of Knoxville, Iowa, the second biggest Knoxville in the United States behind Knoxville, Tennessee. (laughs) And there's about eight or nine. It's kind of like Springfield. There's a whole bunch of those across the United States named after Henry Knox and just a little bit of his cultural background that can give context, not just to him, but also what revolutionary American society looks like and helps explain some of the animosity against the British. Knox was Scotch-Irish by background. And I mentioned earlier that on the Quebec campaign, many of those soldiers were Scotch-Irish and the hope was that they would be hardy. And they were hardy, but they weren't woodsmen. But many troops were Scotch-Irish in the Continental Army. That's because from 1710 to 1775, About 250,000 Presbyterians from different parts of Ireland arrived in America in order to escape religious, political, and economic persecution or just general hardship. And these Scotch-Irish have a very different worldview from the Anglican English, and this really colors their loyalties to England, and it also affects how they farm and how they fight. Andrew Jackson comes from the Scotch-Irish stock, if you want to get a sense of what kind of people these were, of these scrawny SOBs who... Tough customers, short temper. (laughs) Cannot accept defeat, even if they've been pinned five times, which is how Andrew Jackson wrestled. Right. Listen to our Presidential Fight Club episodes with Andrew Jackson to give you an idea of uh, Scotch-Irish American culture and... Knox is from that. He's he's more of the gentlemanly, refined stock, being a, a learned bookman, but this is where he's from. So about a third or even as many as half of the Continental troops were Scotch-Irish. So a little bit of info on Knox. And yeah, so tell us a little bit about what he does and his famous episode. All right. So uh, Knox had come to Washington's attention. Washington, I don't want to get too psychological, Scott, but he... He seemed to have uh, a desire to have not a father figure, was a son figure. Washington never had any of his own children. He never had a son or a daughter. And we're going to see over the course of the war, Washington is really good at finding young talent and raising them up. You know, he doesn't say, well, how, many, how much experience do you have? Oh, none. Oh, well, then get out of here. It's almost as if Washington prefers people with little or no experience because he's going to train them and and he's going to get people put these people in very uh, significant positions of authority. We'll see Knox. We'll see Nathaniel Green, who we've already mentioned a little bit, Alexander Hamilton, uh, John Lawrence, uh, several others. The Marquis de Lafayette is going to come over. So Washington's going to have raise up around him a little core of younger men, men that were young enough to be his sons. Uh, and, and Knox is one of those. They're going to get a lot of responsibility for such young men. So um, Knox is 25 years old in 1775. All right. So let's go back and think about the situation around Boston one more time. Let me set the stage again, just to refresh everybody's memory. The British army was bottled up in Boston. Everybody remember the ping pong paddle? With the cookie monster bite bitten out of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cookie. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, very irregular shaped ping pong paddle uh, surrounded by water almost completely 360 degrees, but not quite because there was a little neck, the, the handle of the ping pong paddle, which connected to the mainland. So the British are on the paddle. They're surrounded almost entirely by water and even more significantly beyond the water are uh, is a lot of high ground the battle of bunker hill was all about denying some of that high ground to the americans but they couldn't get it all so uh, washington had arrived by this time and there were about 20,000 militiamen and uh, the budding continental army that which washington is trying desperately to whip into shape these 20,000 or so uh, continental soldiers of various quality, they are surrounding the British, but and they want to get them out. Now, Washington's aggressive. He wants to just attack. He wants to get in boats. 
and just go hit him with all he's got. But his subordinates tell him, uh, General Washington, that's a terrible idea. You don't want to do this. You don't want to take these ragtag, uh, you know, they're not horrible, but they're not great either. You don't want to take these guys across water where they'll get blown up before they even get to Boston. And then even if they do make it to Boston, they have to face seasoned professionals with good artillery. The Continentals didn't have much artillery. So they can't get into Boston, and they really don't have any way of driving the British out of Boston because they don't have cannon. So uh, Henry Knox approaches Washington. He says, hey, uh, General, remember how we captured Fort Ticonderoga? Yes. Well, Fort Ticonderoga had several dozen cannon. And Washington says, yes. And, and Henry Knox says, I think I can get them and bring them down here. What do you think? And Washington goes, absolutely. Of course, I, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> That's not the exact the words that were spoken. I'm sure it was much more formal. But Washington uh, says to Henry Knox, go get them. So Henry Knox is going to personally lead an ex expedition to march all the way up from Boston, up the Hudson River, into well into upstate New York to Fort Ticonderoga and grab those uh, cannon. By the way, this is happening. Uh, let me see. Let me get the exact date. He's going to leave. He's going to reach Ticonderoga on December 5th. So this is before uh, the Americans had retreated from Canada. So I don't want everybody to think that, oh, they're going to run into the other guys that were retreating from Canada. This this is happening uh, before Benedict Arnold well, this, let's see, this is kind of in the middle of the siege. Benedict Arnold is sitting outside of um, Quebec, and he's waiting for Montgomery to come. All right, so anyway, so with that in mind, Knox takes a small group of soldiers. They trudge on up to Fort Ticonderoga. They grab the cannon. They bring them back on 42 sleds pulled by 80 yoke of oxen, and there's over 50 cannons of various types. He brought them over a frozen lake and frozen rivers through very difficult terrain. Again, roads were pretty much non-existent. And they arrived near Boston in late January. By this time, the British had already pretty much planned to evacuate Boston. They realized their position was untenable. But the arrival of these cannons is going to really uh, put the icing on the cake. As I mentioned, Washington wanted to attack the British in Boston, but his subordinates said no. And that's that's an interesting thing, Scott, about Washington that I should mention. Washington would listen to his subordinates. With him as a commander, it was not my way or the highway. He would have a council of war. He would poll all of his subordinate commanders and say, well, what do you think? And if they overruled him, he would usually go with it. Now, there were other times when he would stick to his guns and, and, and just make a decision, but here, it's a good thing that he listened to them because it probably would have been disastrous if they had tried to attack into Boston. So instead, his subordinates say, let's put the cannon on the Dorchester Heights. This is a very high uh, set of ground to the south of the town of Boston. And Washington agrees to this plan. Now, they have to be careful, Scott, because they can't just they – they have to do it secretly. They have to be sneaky. They can't just go up there in broad daylight and start – uh, building fortifications and dragging cannon up there, because if they do and the British see them, the British are just going to turn the cannons on them and blast them. Especially, we got to keep in mind that the British also had a lot of ships floating around and they had guns. So this is an amazing thing. I love this story. The Patriots are going to disguise what they did. They placed bales of hay along the shore so the British could not see what they were doing. Um, the British would have seen and they, oh, okay, just it's just hay they're stacking up hay. And they also built the elements of a redoubt off site. So remember, a redoubt is just kind of a small temporary fort. So instead of building it on the Dorchester Heights, they build it elsewhere. It's like prefabricated housing, Scott. <laughs> yeah, revolutionary are uh, doing all your nailing of wooden posts together off site. That's right. And so they bring it almost ready to go, they just have to put it together. And to distract the British, they also, just for good measure, they use the cannons they have and they bombard Boston so that the British will be busy and they won't have that much time to be staring up. <laughs> so what are the Americans doing right now? I wonder why they have all those bales of hay. They don't have time to think about that because they're getting blasted. The British fired back. 
And finally, on the night of March 4th, the Continentals dragged the parts of the readout up onto the heights, and they finished building it. And the next morning, lo and behold, the British woke up to see uh, the completed readout on the heights with several thousand men and 20 cannon guarding it. It would have seemed like, wow, a fort just popped up overnight. Great. And it's got cannon trained right on us. General Howe, the British commander, he's supposed to have said, quote, my God, these fellows have done more work in one night than I could make my army do in three months. <laughs> Isn't that a great <laughs> quote? Do you know what the size of this fort was or this readout? I don't have that information in front of me. I do not know. I'm sorry. It couldn't have been just gigantic, but it was significant enough to kind of put a scare into the British. And so finally, on March 17th, that, that just sealed the decision to leave. They were, Again, as I mentioned, they were already pretty much planning on it. But now with that staring down on them, it's like, okay, time to leave. <laughs> so less than two weeks later, on March 17th, this is 1776 now, 9,000 British soldiers plus their dependents and about 1,000 loyalists leave on 78 ships. So the British bug out of Boston, including, as I mentioned, 1,000 loyalists. These are people who had lived in Boston or at least Massachusetts their entire lives in most cases, in a lot of cases, or at least for a very long time. But they're going to have to leave because they stayed loyal to the crown. And so that's it. And Boston falls into the hands of Washington and the Continental Army. And Boston will stay in American hands for the rest of the war and become a very significant uh, base for the Americans. You really have to be impressed by how fast people in the pre-modern era can move under duress. A lot of times life doesn't move quickly, but this is one example in a previous episode, we mentioned the First Crusade, joking about the siege of Quebec and they march around the city seven times like the Old Testament. The Patriots do not do that, but in the First Crusade in 1099, they actually do do that around Jerusalem. Also, Godfrey of Bouillon, I think, the force he's leading the First Jerusalem, they basically build a siege tower and an all-nighter to get over the walls of Jerusalem. They have to do it in secret so they're not hit by missiles and other uh, medieval darts and arrows and other stuff, but same kind of thing. Under duress, it's amazing what people in the pre-modern period can build very quickly. So got to give it to those colonials. Henry Knox, good on you and score one for the Patriots. All right. So that is all for this campaign. In the next battle in our series, this is key battle four. We're going to be looking at the New York campaign. Thanks for listening to the key battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com, where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of madeira and raise a toast to liberty. Liberty.